Well, it's 8 p.m. on the East Coast. Welcome to the Internet Bible Study at the School of Christ. Org. This is Chip Brogdon, and uh, we're beginning with our first webinar of the new year, 2010, continuing in our series of messages from the book of Colossians. Tonight we're in Colossians chapter 3. We have um, almost 300 people registered to be on the webinar tonight, so uh, welcome to everyone. It's good to see very, uh, very familiar faces. Some of you are regulars here. Some of you are, are new, so I want to welcome you. In addition to the people I've already welcomed, uh, also Donnie in Australia and Marilyn in Ohio. So welcome to one and all as we kick off another series of webinars. Uh, picking up where we left off before the holiday break in Colossians chapter 3. Now if you've not been to the website recently, uh, you can go online and you'll get the previous webinars of Colossians 1. There's two webinars for Colossians 1. So there's a there's a chapter 1, part 1, and then a chapter 1, part 2. We finished with Colossians 2, uh, but that's not been posted yet. So it, it's not been posted because the recording did not come out. I'll have to re-record that on my own and I will get that posted probably about the same time that we get tonight's study posted. So every once in a while the recording doesn't come out and I have to go back and re-record it, but that's okay. I'm quite willing and honored to do that so that we can keep a record of this and you can refer to it over and over again. So you've got your Bibles, hopefully, and uh, by now you've probably turned to Colossians chapter 3. So why don't we go ahead and commit this time to the Lord ask him to bless our study. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity and for the privilege to come together as one body in Christ and to ponder and peruse and search the scriptures. I thank you that your words are living and they are, they are true and they're quicker than or sharper than any two-edged sword. They're alive and powerful. Uh, so, Lord, tonight we pray your Holy Spirit would grant us the revelation of Christ. It would give us illumination. The eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we would know, uh, not just know mentally, Lord, but know with our heart, know with our spirit. So, tonight, thank you for this time that we have. Thank you for the tools, the resources, everything that it takes to put these uh, studies together and for the people to come out and to give of their time. I thank you for it, Lord. Thanks for the privilege and the opportunity to be here um, doing the School of Christ and and to have the opportunity to interact with, with people all over the world for your kingdom purposes. We praise you tonight, and we thank you. I pray that every need, every concern would be met and would be ministered to by your Holy Spirit, and by the ministry and study of your word. So we praise you tonight, and we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we've already gotten started um, in Colossians, and uh, so we continue tonight with Colossians chapter 3, continuing with this uh, prison epistle of Paul. So I think tonight we could take chapter 3, and uh, I don't expect that we'll, we'll be very long. I'm trying to, to do these studies and be very concise and to the point and give you an opportunity to ask questions if you have questions and try to answer them as best as I can, but to, to try, and, uh, try and, and be a good steward of the time and the resources that we have and that you have so that we're not on here so long that, that people um, just can't stay through until the end. So if that's okay with you. And um, at the same time, if, if we really get on a roll and things start to happen, I'm not going to be concerned if we go over the, the allotted time. I'm just going to be led by the Spirit as best as we can. If you have to go, you have to go. 
and uh, you could always pick back up on the recording after it's posted to the website. So Colossians chapter 3, and I think we can probably sum this chapter up as Christ-centered relationships. Now, that's what we're all about here at the School of Christ, Christ-centered teaching for Christ-centered living. Uh, so we want to be Christ-centered, and in our relationships especially, it's important that Christ have the preeminence in all of our relationships. So Colossians chapter 3, we're going to delve into these relationships a little bit, and I think we can divide it up into three areas. First, your relationship with God. Secondly, your relationship with the body of Christ, with one another. And finally, your relationship with your family. And by family, I mean with those that are closest to you. So let's get started in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. And once again, I just have to stop here and point out how concerned Paul is for your mind. And if you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and you believe that, that those who wrote, wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then we can say that the Holy Spirit is concerned for your mind. We've had quite a lot to say about your mind, about your thoughts. So yes, God is concerned for your spirit. Yes, he wants you to have a relationship with him and it's a spiritual relationship but Scripture has quite a bit to say about your thoughts, about your mind. So here Paul says, through the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit through Paul, says, set your mind on things above. So my question to begin with is, what do you think about? What do you spend your time thinking about? What do you set your mind on? Now, King James says affection. Uh, I'm reading from the New King James, but regardless, your your mind, your emotions, what what do they center on? As a man thinks, so is he, it says in Proverbs. And so what you set your mind on is very important. Scripture says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died, verse 3, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Now, the word members there doesn't mean put to death your church members. It's talking about your, your body, your body parts. Put to death your, your members which are on the earth. And now he, he's going to list things that your 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 physical members, your, your the things that your body is capable of doing wrong. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So he says, put to death your members which are on the earth. Because of these things, verse 6, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now, let's stop right there and talk about your relationship with God. Now, you notice here in the first few verses that we've read, it's talking about primarily your relationship with God, and it's working on you. It, it, it's talking about things that you need to do for yourself. It's not getting into your relationships with other people right now. It's talking about you have a relationship with God now that you've been raised with Christ. Now, here's how to manage yourself. Here's how you look or should look 
here's how you should be behaving, here's what your mindset should be like, and, and here's some things that you need to do to take care of yourself first before you try to preach or, or teach other people or before you try to reach other people. Preaching, teaching, and reaching, that's pretty good, isn't it? Well, we're so concerned with what other people are doing and what other people are learning, and if we're reaching other people and if, if, uh, if we're bringing people to the Lord. But look, you've got to, first of all, Jesus says, get the log out of your eye before you try to help somebody else get the speck out of their eye. And I remember from my emergency medical technician training many, many years ago, I remember something the instructor told me, and he said, if you are driving the ambulance to a wreck and you get in a wreck with the ambulance, you can't help anybody, and now you've just made the problem even worse. So he said that to reinforce the fact that the, your primary objective is not to get there fast, it's, it's to get there safely. <laughs> so I thought that was good advice. But, you know, as Christians, it's really easy to look at the world and see what's wrong with the world. It's really easy to look at the church and see what's wrong with the church. And we have very, very clear vision, 2020 vision, it seems. We're very perceptive and very discerning when it comes to figuring out what's wrong with everybody else. But in the, in the practical application of these verses here, in Colossians chapter 3, what we're looking at is not what's wrong with everybody else, but what needs to happen with me. First and foremost, here are the things that we need to pay attention to, and it's all going on between our ears. It's our thoughts. That's where it all begins. And then it begins in our bodies, in, in the lust of our flesh. So we've got to deal with that first. Let's deal with that. Then Jesus says, after you've gotten the log out of your eye, you can see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. So our relationship with God is where it all begins. And first of all, he says, you are, if then you were raised with Christ. And he's talking about this in the past tense. If then you were raised with Christ. This is speaking about our identification with Christ. The Lord. Identification means that he assumed my position and I assumed his position on the cross. Now that's a, a detailed, lengthy subject. I talk more about it in my book, Embrace the Cross, which by the way, if you haven't gotten, please do get a copy. You need to get a copy of it so that you can uh, really grasp the, the importance of embracing the cross. What does it mean? What does identification mean? I'm telling you folks, your victory is tied to that cross. If you can understand the significance, the, the importance of the cross, not just to save you, but to sanctify you, not just to, to give you a way to get to heaven, but to give you the victory, not just for a future hope, but for a present truth and a present reality and a present overcoming. If you can grasp that, it will set you free. Uh, so I, I don't apologize at all in saying and recommending my own book to you. I can't recommend anybody else's book. The only book I can recommend is the book that I've written <laughs> because that's, that's what I'm responsible for. I'm responsible to God for what I know, and this is a stewardship from me to you. So... I encourage you to look that up if you haven't already done so because it gets into more detail than I can here in this brief time that we have. But it's the identification with Christ, the fact that I am crucified with Christ. That's where it all begins in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified, or I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And that, friends, is the secret to the Christian life. It's the basis of everything Paul is trying to teach us about who we are in Christ. So he says in verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ, and he's referring back to chapter 2, verse 13. Well, actually, let's go back to chapter 2, verse 12, where he says that you were buried with him in baptism. See, that's identification. It doesn't say he was buried for you and raised for you and died for you. Certainly, that's true also. 
But it says that we died with him. We were buried with him. We were raised with him. It goes back to together. Together we are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ. So you see this throughout scripture. So buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, I'm in verse 13 of chapter 2 of Colossians. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together, there's the word, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, and what did he do with it? Having nailed it to the cross. You see, it's it, that's where the two shall become one. That's where it happened, right there on the cross. So we go back to Colossians 3, and Paul says, Now, if you were raised with Christ, here's how you should be looking at things. Here's how you should be living. Um, this is your spiritual position. Now, it's not your earthly position. It's your spiritual position. And people say, I don't understand what you mean when it says that I'm seated with Christ. I don't feel like I'm seated with Christ. It feels like, seems like that I'm seated, seated right here on the earth. Well, we are talking about your spiritual position. When Paul says, I was crucified with Christ. He didn't mean that he was there on the cross physically being crucified with Jesus. No more than when Paul says you were raised with him, does he mean that we were literally and physically there in the tomb with Jesus and raised from the dead? We would have remembered that. But this is something that goes much deeper than just the physical presence or just the literal meaning. There is a spiritual thing that's happen, happening here that has happened to us in Christ that is even more profound than something that would have taken place in the natural realm. Um, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, Paul declares. So it's being one spirit with Jesus is more important than being one flesh with Jesus or even being in the same physical presence with Jesus. And that might be hard for you to understand or to, to grasp. Uh, because we, for the most part, we think as earthly people, we think about earthly things and spiritual things, heavenly things, really do not make much of an impression upon us. That's just the reality, and that's why Paul is saying, set your mind on things above. Stop thinking about earthly things. Don't dwell on it. Don't focus on it. For you died, it says in verse 3, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. See, your real life is with Christ. You think, I've got this life down here on the earth. No, your real life is with Christ, your spiritual life. That's why we're, we're so concerned that you grow spiritually, that you grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. So Paul always begins with your spiritual position. But here's the thing about Paul, and maybe you've noticed it as we study his letters, as you read his letters, you may have noticed this. Paul has this annoying habit, if I could say it that way, this annoying habit of bringing us back around to a practical application. He always starts out spiritually. He always starts out with us being in Christ in the heavenly places, and we would just like to stay there perhaps and get lost in the cloud and get lost in some spiritual la-la land and not have to deal with things on the earth, not really to have any kind of responsibility and just kind of float around on a cloud and play a harp and talk about how spiritual we are. But one thing about Paul, he starts out in the spiritual, but he always ends up in the natural. He always brings it back around to a practical application. And for him, to have a spiritual position in Christ meant that there was an effect. There was some fruit to come forth. There was a stewardship involved that could be seen and revealed and manifested in the earth, in the earthly existence. So Paul is intensely spiritual, far and above spiritual and heavenly minded, but he's also eminently practical. Intensely spiritual, but eminently practical. 
and sometimes it's very frustrating. I would love to stay in in the exalted heavenlies, seated with Christ in the heavenly places, raised with him. I'd like to just stay there and not even have to deal with loving my neighbor and all the other things that I have to do because I'm here on the earth. I would prefer just to stay in that spiritual realm because that's kind of invisible and, uh, you know, everything is done for me. I don't have to do anything on my, on my, on my own. So I, I think that's a temptation to get real real heavenly and, and spirit, spiritually sounded and sounding. And, you know, if you're not careful, that can become just a, a passive kind of laziness. So Paul is definitely not a lazy person. He is intensely spiritual, yes. Set your mind on things above, not on the earth, yes. He would say that. But then he would bring it right back around, and he does bring it right back around to something that is very, very practical. And he says, therefore, in verse 5, put to death your members. <laughs> See, there's something for you to do. You've got to put off the old, he says. Put off the old man and put on the new man. Now, this is a thing that, that comes up more than once, of putting off the old man, putting on the new man. I believe that the new man is Christ. It's not talking about turning over a new leaf. And, you know, here we are at the first of the year, and people come up with their New Year's resolutions, and they resolve that they're going to do the things they're supposed to do, and they're going to stop doing the things that they're not supposed to do. And, um, you know, that's good. I, I sit down at the first of the year, and, and um, I, I prayerfully map out, some goals and some things that I want to, to accomplish uh, throughout the year, and I review those things from time to time. Nothing wrong with that. But what we're talking about with putting on the new man, we're not talking about turning over a new leaf. You're not the new man. Christ is the new man. And I can, uh, I can demonstrate that to you with a few scriptures here. Romans 13, 14. Romans 13, 14 says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So in, in Galatians or in Colossians, Paul is saying put on the new man. And in Romans, he's saying put on the Lord Jesus. So I believe the new man is the Lord Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the new man. Galatians 3.27 says, for as many of you has been as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Putting on the Lord Jesus, putting on Christ, putting on the new man. Ephesians 4.24 says, put on the new man, created in God's own righteousness and true holiness. What a difference between this false holiness of trying to to keep rules and regulations, which is really not holiness at all. It's really just legalism. What a, di what a difference between legalism and true holiness, which is a person. True holiness is a man. True holiness is putting on the Lord Jesus. True holiness is putting on the new man. True holiness is putting on Christ. And then, of course, in Ephesians 6, it says, put on the whole armor of God. And we've already taught from Ephesians 6 that Christ is the whole armor of God. You can look that up on the website under Ephesians 6. So everything is, is always centered on Christ. And that's why we're talking about Christ-centered relationships. Putting off the old and putting on the new is, is not turning over a new leaf, making a New Year's resolution. It's, it's, it's the, the spiritual principle that I am crucified with Christ, acknowledging that and living according to that spiritual truth. I have put off the old man because I am crucified with Christ, and I have put on the new man already because I was raised with him from the dead. Now, that's what the scripture says. So the end result of that is in verse, um, in verse 11, 
but um, first of all, verse 10, have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Praise God. Christ is all and in all. Praise the Lord. So, that's your relationship with God. Now let's look at your relationship with the body of Christ. Once we've started putting on the new man and walking in the new life that is ours in Christ, naturally we're going to come into contact with other people, with other uh, believers, other disciples, other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And this is the basis of our spiritual fellowship. Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. Now, he's not in all people. He's in all Christian people. He's in all disciples, all believers. We don't want to get into this New Age idea that you have a, you have a divine spark and that Christ is in everybody. Um, because there was a time, Paul says, when you were you were living according to the prince of the power of the air. You were living according to the dictates of your flesh. You were alienated from God. And uh, he says that because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So when we say that Christ is all and in all, we're not talking about the sons of disobedience. We're not talking about the people who have yet to come to Christ. We have not, we're not referring to all people everywhere. We're talking about right now our spiritual fellowship. Christ is all and in all for those who are in him and for those who, who in whom he is. <laughs> well, that's the basis of our spiritual fellowship. Fellowship along any other lines except for Christ is all and in all, may be religious, it may be social, but it's definitely not spiritual. The only fellowship basis that we have for a spiritual fellowship is Christ being all and in all. Now, in this I see two aspects. Number one, among those who are born again, those who are part of the ecclesia, the body of Christ, Two aspects to the spiritual fellowship. Number one, Christ is all. Christ is all. And that is referring to the preeminence of Christ. And we've talked about that in Colossians 1. It's the theme of Colossians. That in all things, Christ should have the preeminence. So Christ is all. Christ is everything. That is the first aspect of our spiritual fellowship. And then the second aspect is in all. So first, Christ is all. Secondly, Christ in all. Christ in you. That's the revelation Paul says. This is the mystery that has been hidden but is now revealed to the saints. So it's not revealed to everybody. It's revealed to the saints. Which is what he says in, in Colossians 1. Christ in you the hope of glory, Christ in you, so that that's whom we preach. So Christ is all and in all. That's the basis of our spiritual fellowship with him and the basis of our spiritual fellowship with one another. Now, you try to have a fellowship on anything less than that, it will not succeed. Or... It will succeed, but not for any spiritual purpose. And in that category, you can place a lot of, of meetings and, and things that are done uh, in the religious world. You can put a lot of social things in there. Maybe they're not good or bad in and of themselves. All I'm trying to say is that it's not a spiritual fellowship if it only aims to 
be similarities along the lines of teaching or belief or religion or denomination or social or common interests. That's not a spiritual fellowship. A spiritual fellowship exists where the people have a similar mindset and a similar heart that says Christ is all and in all. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's our spiritual fellowship. That's your relationship with the body. So what, what does that look like? Well, verse 12, therefore, as the elect of God, holy, say you're the elect of God, holy and beloved. And say, let me, let me stop right here. And I, I keep going back to this for the benefit of somebody. I'm not sure who it is. Maybe they're listening now. Maybe they're listening later. But when it, there's two things happening in God's ultimate purpose. There's an ultimate purpose and plan of God that says that God wants Christ to have the preeminence in all things. It says he desires all men would be saved and would come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, obviously, if he desires all men to be saved, all men are not yet saved. Because you don't desire for something that you already have. So God's desire is for all the world, that the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Well, that's speaking in the future tense. Obviously, we're not there yet. Hebrews chapter 2 says we do not yet see all things submitted to him. But listen, just because you don't yet see it, just because it hasn't yet come to pass, doesn't mean it's not in the heart of God to bring it about. It just means it hasn't come to pass yet. Now, in the meantime, there is an elect. There is a chosen generation. There is a royal priesthood. There is a holy nation. And holy means set apart for divine purposes. It doesn't mean you're better than everybody else. This is where we need to, to really get it through our head. Chosen doesn't mean the only people. It just means you're chosen. You have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are the elect of God, holy set apart for what purpose not just so God could save you and to hell with everyone else I mean that's really the kind of attitude that I think has crept into uh, Christendom that God is really only interested in the few and the many are gonna go to hell anyway but actually see God is interested in all men if I am lifted up I will draw all men to me now when you express that you're not you're not saying that God sees everybody as the same and he doesn't make any distinction because clearly it says that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience you cannot get away from the law of sowing and reaping if you sow to the flesh you will reap of the flesh corruption but if you sow to the spirit you will reap of the spirit eternal life. So don't confuse the two concepts, and that's why, you know, well, I'm not going to get into it, but I just want to clarify that for somebody. If it's somebody listening, if it's somebody here or in the future, uh, don't confuse these two concepts. But don't think that because you're set apart and, and you're saved that somehow you're special and everyone else is not special because um, God so loved the world. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You need to hold both concepts in your hands at the same time and not see it as either or, but see it as both and. Okay, so as the elect of God, see, you have a responsibility. You have a stewardship. You have a testimony. You have a ministry. To whom? Well, to one another, yes. To the Lord, yes. But also to those who don't know him yet. So, as the elect of God, how should you behave? What should your character be like? And don't get me wrong, we're not saying that you start acting this way in order to prove that you are something. You don't act this way in order to become something. We're saying because you already are something, this is how you should be behaving. I mean, this is just, how, this is just what it means to live the normal Christian life. And Paul's going to lay it out for us. Therefore, verse 12, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, 
put on tender mercies. Here we are with putting on again. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. And every bit of this has to do with your relationships with one another. Long-suffering. Do you, do you know that long-suffering is different from patience? I did a study on the difference between long-suffering and patience. And here's what I discovered. Patience has to do with your circumstances. Long-suffering has to do with people. When you bear up with difficult circumstances, it's called patience. When you bear up with difficult, with difficult people, it's called long-suffering. 1 Corinthians 13, in that great love chapter, Paul says, love suffers long and is patient. <laughs> so it's talking about your relationships with one another. Verse 13, here we are, bearing with one, bearing with one another. It's hard to say. It's even harder to do. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. We need to stop being such whining, complaining people and just learn just to let go, just forgive and forget and move on. It's just easier that way. It takes a lot of work to hold a grudge. It takes a lot of work to be bitter. It drains you. It, it saps your strength. It makes your face all drawn down. It's easier just to, if you have a complaint, just forgive and move on just as Christ forgave you. You say that's easier said than done. Well, yeah, that's true. But we're putting off the old man and we're putting on the new man. And it's not difficult for Christ. It's not difficult for the new man. It's only difficult for the old man. So right, right there you can see which man are you living out of? Are you living out of the old you or Christ in you? That's the key. Verse 14, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, being perfected in love. Verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your heart, in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. See, we're still talking about one body. We're still talking about your relationships with one another. So what do you put on? You put on tender mercies and kindness, and humility and meekness and long-suffering. You put on love because love is the bond of perfection. It's the bond of maturity. Those who are spiritually mature know how to, how to love. Those who are spiritually immature, they know how to love also. They just love themselves. They're primarily in love with themselves. So putting on love means to love one another and to love God. Love God and love your neighbor. And then, <laughs> this is interesting, let the word, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. He says, sing. What, what an odd thing. What a, what a strange thing to command people. <laughs> Here's the word of the Lord. Sing. Sing and, and admonish and teach one another with psalms and with hymns and with spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. So when you, when you come to a place that Christ is all, Christ is everything, when you come to a place that you, you understand that I am in him and he is in me, and that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, you begin to accept this work of the cross, and it is a twofold work. Talk about it in my book. I also talk about it on the website. It's a twofold work of the cross. The first work of the cross is what Jesus did for me. The second work of the cross is where I take up the cross. 
And this is where the putting on and the putting off come into play. Paul doesn't say because Jesus did it all, you don't have to do anything. What Paul says is since Jesus did everything, now you can follow in his footsteps. Now you can do all of this because he's already done what he has done on your behalf. So once again, instead of looking at it as either or, look at it as both and. It's not that the work of it's not that the work of the cross is complete. It's not complete because you're still growing spiritually. There's a practical application of growing up spiritually. But you're able to grow up spiritually and you're able to follow in his footsteps precisely because of the work that was done on the cross, which makes it possible. So it's a twofold work. Talk about that, and um, so I, I won't go into that in any more detail right now. But you're seeing here the fruit of the Spirit in your relationships with one another once your relationship with the Lord is established, and there is love and there is joy so that we are singing and we're overflowing. And it doesn't mean that we always walk around with a kind of a blank, happy, contented, smiling face all the time. We've got challenges, we've got needs, we've got problems, we've got difficulties, we've got circumstances. But I remember in that Philippian jail when Paul and Silas had been beaten and thrown in the jail and they were in chains and it says at midnight they lift up their heart and they were singing to the Lord and everyone was listening to them. And then here comes the earthquake that set the prisoners free. Now whether or not that actually happens in your circumstances or not, I don't know if it will. But spiritually speaking, it has the same effect. When you sing and when you give thanks to the Lord, we need to, to just ask, ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit to overflowing so that out of our belly will flow rivers of living water. Walking around with a frown on our face all the time and being all down in the, down in the dumps, and just being, I don't know. Well, I do know because I go through those times and so do you. Well, what I'm saying is that Christ who lives in us can overshadow that, can overwhelm that. He can rise up if we allow him. He can come forth as rivers of living water. Well, notice it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, the, let the words of Christ, the words of Christ, because we're not talking about teachings, we're not talking about doctrines, but Paul is talking about the word of Christ, singular, all together, the word of Christ. It's the word of Christ in you, the hope of glory, him we preach, not a doctrine, not a teaching, not even the things that he said as teachings or philosophies. Because listen, there are plenty of New Age authors and teachers who, who get on television and write books and they refer to the words of Jesus and they refer to the teachings of Jesus, but they don't have the word of Christ. They don't have the Christ of the word. They have the words of Christ not the word of Christ. I hope you can understand what I'm getting at, and I hope that you can discern the difference. Just because somebody says Jesus or refer to him uh, or refer to his teachings, it does not mean that Christ dwells in them. So we're not talking about, he, he doesn't say let the words of Christ, but let the word of Christ, Christ himself, dwell in you, the living word. Okay. And then, of course, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so this, this is how Paul connects our spiritual position with our earthly walk. And whatever it is that you're doing, whatever you set your hand to, do it in the name of Jesus. Do it for the glory of God. Do it with every bit of energy that you have, every bit of strength that he strengthens you with. Whatever you do, whatever you say, because it says in word or in deed, do it all, say it all in the name of the Lord Jesus because you represent him and you represent the kingdom of God in your speech and in your actions. That's a responsibility, isn't it? Then going on to verse 18. 
<laughs> Once again, we get into the practical application. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So, um, I, and I read into verse 1 because that really should be in chapter 3 anyway. It's, it's all one thought. I don't know who decided to divide that up there. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't divide it up there. That's all the same thought. So we, we've already started reading now into the third section, which is your relationship with your family, your family. So basically this repeats everything Paul said in Ephesians 5. So uh, I'm not going to repeat the entire teaching from Ephesians 5 here in Colossians 3 because you can look up Ephesians 5 and study that uh, off of the website, what we've already said. Uh, wives submit, husbands love, children obey, fathers don't provoke. Bond servants and masters, and I, I included this as family relationships, even though it's not now, but back then, bond servants were a little bit different from slaves in that they were, they were more employees. They were more like members of the family. Um, they were more like uh, they were very close, closely associated with the household as opposed to today where you probably don't live with your employer. <laughs> uh, you spend eight hours a day or whatever the case may be, but you don't live together. Um, the, the point being that uh, the ones closest to you, this is, this is where the true test is. Now, by yourself, you can be very spiritual. But it's with the people that you're living with, the people that you spend the most time with, the ones closest to you, whether they're living with you or whether you're working with them or whether you're working for them or whether they're working for you, it's the ones closest to you that are the most likely to get on your nerves. <laughs> Isn't that true? So this is where we can really judge. Um, we can really judge our spiritual maturity. We can judge our spiritual life. We can discern our progress in spiritual things by something as mundane as our relationships with those who are closest to us. How many times have we seen examples of people who are very spiritual sitting in church talking about the Bible, but then they go home and their family is a mess, their marriage is atrocious, uh, their relationship with their children is awful. So, uh, this is where the rubber hits the highway, if we could put it like that. It's in our relationships with one another that we can see just how far we've come or uh, how much further we have to go. Now, that's not a criticism. That's just a statement of fact. That's just uh, an example of one way we can measure it. You don't measure spiritual growth by... Bible study facts or, or things like that, it's in the fruit. <laughs> it's in the fruit of the Spirit and how you treat one another, how you speak to one another, how you act around one another. Now, all of us are human. All of us make mistakes. All of us have shortcomings. All of us have personality defects and character weaknesses. And this is exactly why uh, Paul is reminding us of who we are in Christ, who Christ is in us, so that we can allow the Lord to be preeminent in our relationships. That, let, that should be our prayer. Lord, have the preeminence in all my relationships. My relationship with you, yes, but also my relationship with one another in the body of Christ and my relationship with those who are closest to me. And so that's, that's how I see this chapter playing out. 
and being divided. So let's talk about some takeaways. Um, things you can take away from Chapter 3 of Colossians, number one, the cross is how you put to death the old man. The cross, you got to embrace the cross. What do I mean by embracing the cross? Well, get the book. But basically what I'm talking about is embrace this this concept of less of me and more of Jesus. The decreasing of self so that Christ can be increased because it's in the cross, all of that happens, and that's where it takes place. Past and present because it's a twofold work. Yes, the work of the cross is already done, which means now you can take up the cross daily and follow after Jesus. If it wasn't for that first work, you couldn't do the second work. If it wasn't for what Jesus has already done, you couldn't do anything. But because he has done it, now you can follow in his footsteps, and that's what Embrace the Cross is all about. That's what discipleship is all about. Well, Paul says that you died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. See, that's the secret. The secret is, I died with Christ. I am crucified with him. Yet I'm alive, not I, but Christ. That's the secret of the Christian life. So the next thing we can take away from it, from chapter 3, is you have a part to play in the process of putting on and putting off. And again, I, I emphasize, don't, do not think or take the position that Christ has done it all, therefore I don't have to do anything because uh, that's simply not what Scripture teaches. It is a twofold work. You are to co-labor together with you. Now, you don't do it in your own strength. You don't do it in your own wisdom. But you do have a part to play in the process of putting on the new man and putting off the old man. If you didn't have anything to do, then the last half of this entire book is, is superfluous. But look at verse 12 where Paul says, or in... Um, in verses 8 and 12, but now you yourselves are to put off all these things. See, and that's to say God's going to set you free. God's going to deliver you from these things. He says you yourselves are to put off all these things. You put them off, not me. Putting them off for you, not, not God just delivering you from it. But you put it off, and as you put it off, then he empowers, he quickens, he enables, he brings life, he anoints it. And it's quite different from just passively sitting back and waiting for God to do everything when God's already said, you yourselves put off these things and you put on the new man. See, all that is potentially yours, but you've got to put it on. How do you put it on? Well, yeah, you just exercise faith. That's the best I can tell you. Ask God to show you what it means to put it on. First of all, I, I can give you a hint. First of all, is to get your thinking right. Get your thinking aligned with what Scripture says. Get your mind renewed. Because it, if, if you try to, to, to incorporate spiritual truth without your mind being renewed, then your mind is just going to say it's impossible. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. And that's what some of you are going through right now. And it's not because I'm not teaching it correctly, or, you know, maybe it is. <laughs> but it's because your mind resists spiritual truth, the unrenewed portions of your mind. See, it says that those who are carnally minded cannot please God. It says that the carnal man can't know the things of the Spirit of God, can't discern them. Because they're spiritually discerned. So the renewing of your mind is very important. That's another part that you have to play in this process. You can't always go around and expect somebody's going to pray for you or lay hands on you or speak some word over you, and then that's going to be your ticket to victory for the rest of your life. There's a part you play. You have a part in the process of spiritual growth and maturity. And if, if nothing else that you get out of the school of Christ, I hope that I hope we can awaken you to the responsibility that you have for your own spiritual growth and maturity. For too long we have put that responsibility off on the church, on the pastor to tell us what to believe, to tell us what to do, 
on the men and women of God who hold themselves out to be somebody. We have, we have outsourced our spiritual education to, to the ministry, and what we need to do is take responsibility for our own spiritual growth and maturity. Thank God for what we can get from other people, but folks, we need to learn how to go to God. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And I guarantee you, there will be times in your life when you're not going to have a plethora of people or a plethora of people to call upon and give you the encouragement that you want. You've got to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. And you can do that. Paul says, speak to yourselves <laughs> in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your hearts to the Lord so you can encourage yourself in the Lord. But see, my point is you have a part to play in the process. Don't outsource your spiritual growth and maturity. And even in this Bible study, the purpose of this little hour, hour and a half study is, is not to say, well, I've done the, my Bible study for this week. It's to push you in a certain direction and get you stirred up so that you go and, and you take this and you dig into it and you pray and you get God to show you. I mean, you can look at this and see something completely different from what I'm bringing out because there's such depth here. But you have to explore those depths. I'm just hitting on the surface here. You have to explore those depths for yourself. So there's a part we all play. Uh, the third takeaway from Chapter 3, and here's a quote from one of my articles, something that God showed me the hard way. And it's this, the loftiest spiritual service will never take away from the most mundane earthly responsibility. Now, I wish that were not so. I wish I could say, just get spiritual, just get heavenly minded, forget about your earthly responsibilities, you know, just just live in perpetual prayer and meditation and just worship God all day. Quit your job, don't pay your bills, <laughs> live in a cave. I'd love to be able to tell you that. I'd love to be able to live that kind of a lifestyle, but um, God corrected me from that mindset many, many years ago, and so I share that wisdom with you. The loftiest spiritual service will never take away from the most mundane earthly responsibility, and we see it right here in Colossians 3. Paul is saying, set your mind on things above not on things of the earth, and then it gets all the way down, all the way down to husbands love your wives, wives submit to your husbands. If, if that's not a fall from heaven down into smack dab every day, when you get up in the morning and you look that other person in the eye, that's where it all comes to to reality. That's where you know if you're walking in the truth or if you're just talking a bunch of gibberish. <laughs> but isn't it interesting in the very same chapter? He, where he says, set your affection on things above, not on earthly things, that he would also give you these mundane instructions about loving your, loving your wife and submitting to your husband and children obeying your parents and father, fathers don't provoke your children to wrath, about work relationships and how you treat one another. It, it's very interesting, isn't it? The truth of this statement, the loftiest spiritual service, the loftiest spiritual revelation, the loftiest spiritual mindset will never take away or diminish the most mundane earthly responsibility and calling that you can think of. It's very interesting how one goes together with the other, even though it seems to be a contradiction. But time and time again, I have seen it, and that's where... Your spirituality is put to the test, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's open it up for um, just a few minutes of questions and answers. If you have a, a uh, if uh, you have a microphone and a headphone set, you're welcome to to uh, raise your hand and just click on that hand icon. And uh, you can raise your hand to indicate to me that you'd like to get in on the conversation, ask a question. And I'll try to make a connection and get you in on the program so that everyone can hear us speaking back and forth. Um, 
Otherwise, if you prefer, you can type in your question into the question box, and I'll try to uh, read the questions and answer it. Okay, so now is your tie. Is anyone there? Can anyone hear me? Well, either I covered it very, very well and there's no questions, or no one can hear me, <laughs> or you just aren't interested. Well, now here's a good question. Um, do I have to obey my parents who are non-believers? Interesting question. How would, you, how would you respond to that? Do I have to obey my parents who are non-believers? Well, let's look at the situation. First of all, how old are you? How old are you? Now, if you are a minor, then yes, you have to obey your parents, even if they're non-believers. Um, in, in what other aspect would you be obeying them? If you're an adult, you're not obligated to obey your parents anyway because you're an adult. So... I, I guess the, the right way to answer the question would be you can have respect for your parents because they are your parents, but it doesn't mean that you have to obey them in matters of faith and belief and spiritual walk. Uh, certainly you're not going to put your parents above um, your faith or, or above your relationship with God. In the same way, and this gets into the teaching back in Ephesians 5, um, in the same way, I don't think Scripture is telling wives that they must submit to abusive husbands, whether it's physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, or any other kind of abuse. I don't think that's what Scripture is getting at. Uh, so in the same sense, it, you know, it depends on what your non-believing parents are asking you to do. You take that to the Lord, and you pray about it. And you can respectfully say um, yes or no, depending on you know how you're led in that situation and depending on what the situation is. So I, I hope that helps. Um, Someone says, I understand that the words of Jesus are the teachings, parables, etc. is the word of Christ having Christ in you. I believe so, yes. Um, and what, I'm, what I was trying to do there is bring out, I think, a distinction between, um, between the things that Jesus is saying versus Jesus himself. And there are many people who, who cling to and quote the words of Jesus, but not the word of Jesus, not Jesus himself. I think that's what Paul was talking about when he says, him we preach. Not just preaching things about him, but preaching him as the person, Christ as all and in all. Uh, so yes, there is, there is I believe, uh, a difference. And again, I, I see so many New Age teachers and authors and people who reference and and teach and quote things that Jesus says, but they don't have Christ himself. So, very important. Okay, um, let's see. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing very well with my uh, connection here, my ability to click on people and do the microphone thing, so it, I'm going to mostly just look to the question box here. Um, Diana comments, I like how Paul said that we put off and put on in verses 8 and 12. The responsibility is ours to do these things. 
you know, that's exactly right. Um, there's a balance here. And I, I always try to find the balance in between the two extremes. The first extreme says, as I've already mentioned, Jesus did it all. That means I don't have to do anything. I can just kind of meander through life and just be passive and and really there's nothing for me to do because Jesus did it all. Well, that's a oversimplification and that's um, that's incorrect. But then you have the other extreme that says it's up to me. I've got to get holy. I've got to get sanctified. I've got to crucify my flesh. I've got to kill my old man. I've I've got to I've got to run through a troop and leap over a wall and they're doing everything in their own strength and that's an extreme. Uh, because Jesus says, you can't do anything apart from me. Without me, you can't do anything. But with me and through me, you can do all things. And so that's the key there. So yes, the responsibility is ours to uh, to have that relationship in place, to know who we are in him, to know who he is in us, and see it as, as, a, as a co-laboring together. So praise God. If you see that and you get that, then great. You're ahead of a lot of people. Most people have a difficult time finding the medium in between the two extremes. Most of them are either legalistic and trying to do it all at their own strength, or they're completely passive, not doing anything, and one group is just reacting against the other group. And I have found usually wisdom is, is somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. It's the balance between the two extremes. Uh, so then Patrick has a question that's good. How do we discern the line between us doing the work and not I, but Christ? And Patrick, it's not easy. I mean, I, I think that's what keeps you on your knees before God and, and living in a moment-by-moment -moment trusting relationship to say, uh, Lord, is this you? Is is this me or is this you? And not to become obsessed with it, or, because you can get so obsessed trying to figure out if it's me or if it's God, that you you are you are paralyzed and you never do anything because you're afraid. Oh, I might step out ahead of the Lord and it might be me instead of Him. So, you know, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about that. Um, I just trust that the Holy Spirit is big enough to show me. I trust that the Holy Spirit is is able to show me when I'm in my own strength or when I'm in the strength of the Lord, when I am doing the work or when he is doing the work. Um, uh, there's just a, a, a knowing. There's a discernment. There's a discernible difference that I, I sense in my spirit as well as in my in my thoughts and even in my body sometimes when I know that I'm doing the work of the Lord in his strength versus trying to do the Lord's work in my own strength. Well, for one thing, when I do it in my own strength, uh, it's, it's very difficult, it's very tiring, um, it's very frustrating, and there's no flow, there's no, there's no life. And so... Um, that's that's how I discern it. It's not a fine line. It's it, or or a very sharp line. It's not um, it's not always easy to say. But you learn by experience. You learn by doing, and as you as you do, you will um, you, you'll get better at at understanding where the strength of the Lord is. It's much easier to flow in a current that already exists than it is to try and build up something in your own strength and make something happen. And so you, you just learn that by doing it, by experiencing it a few times, and then you then you um, you, you learn not to get ahead of God. You, you, you learn how. It's just like riding a bike. You start out with your training wheels on, don't you? And then as you get used to keeping your balance, those training wheels can come off, and now you can ride a bike. But, um, uh, yeah, so... You just become more experienced in that, and, and then it becomes easier to discern.
Uh, he, here's a question. It's, it's a, a comment regarding the body of Christ. It's been on my heart a lot about Christians fighting against each other. Are they not reading the scriptures? It hurts my heart. Well, you know, there's a lot going on uh, as the reasons why Christians fight against one another. It, it's just evidence of spiritual immaturity. It just means that we haven't grown up. Uh, it means we still have some growing up left to do. We all start out uh, in, with this fighting one another. That's, that's how we are born into the world. Uh, hopefully, as we are submitted to the cross, as we take up the cross daily and follow after him, as we are decreased and he is increased, uh, hopefully that becomes less and less. But it's it's uh, it's not going to be it's not going to be an overnight transformation. It's going to take a lot of growth and 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 maturity. And quite frankly, some people will never grow out of it. They will always be fighting one another. They'll always be uh, doing that. Point is, we don't have to. We can make a decision. We can choose uh, to to embrace the cross, to set our affection on things above, to walk in love. So important to learn how to walk in love. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We all make mistakes. We need a lot more grace for one another. Uh, to be able to overlook some things, to be able to, to more easily forgive. And that just takes growth and maturity. Uh, let's see. Richard has a question. What is the name of your book? What is the main theme? Is it found on Amazon? Not looking for a commercial, but just the facts. <laughs> I love it. Okay, what is the name of your book? It's Embrace the Cross. The uh, main theme is is the cross. Uh, no, it's not found on Amazon. You can't get it at bookstores. It's only available on our website. Or you can go directly to embracethecross.org. Okay, so here's a question. In verse 13, are we to still deal with the grievance that we have against one another? Or are we to just overlook and just forgive? Great question. And uh, I've actually, it reminds me of, a, of an audio CD I've got on overcoming uh, bitterness and unforgiveness. You can look that up on the website also, but I go into more detail with that. You know, it depends on the situation. Sometimes it's better just to forgive and forget and go on. Uh, sometimes it, it requires you to go to that other person and to to make amends and to, and to talk it out. So uh, it depends on the situation. For instance, if uh, if you were abused as a child and the the parent who abused you has already died, then obviously you can't go to that parent and and make things right or or so forth. And I'm not recommending even if if your abuser is still alive that you go seek them out. That may not be the right thing to do. But for your own spiritual growth, for your own emotional health, you forgive whether you seek them out or not, you you let it go. Some things you just have to overlook, sometimes some things you just have to forgive. Uh, most people are not very good at confrontation and going and working it out. And so you, you just have to be led of the Lord. It depends on the situation. Then again, sometimes we get, we get upset and angry and, and hurt over things that the other person has absolutely no idea that they had anything to do with. So the, the, uh, the complexities of the human mind and the emotions are, are deep indeed. Um, I'm primarily talking about your own spiritual growth and maturity and your own mental and emotional health um, that it's it's best for you. Whether that other person ever changes, whether that other person even knows about it or even cares about it, uh, it's best for you that you move on, you forgive, and... Um, 
you know, forgive and forget is kind of a cliche. I don't, I'm not certain that you should ever forget because if you forget, then you'll tend to get yourself right back into the same situation. And I don't think God wants us to submit to people who are intent on abusing us, taking advantage of us, hurting us. And that's why I counsel people to get out of church. Uh, not to stay in the sinking ship and try to save it, but to get out. Because the longer you are in an abusive situation, whether it's spiritual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, whatever the abusive situation is, I think the best remedy is to get out of it. Um, so take all of that into consideration with, with your own personal issues there. Um, Donna has a question. When talking about anger, rage, and so on, are the scriptures talking about a momentary anger or something more like a grudge? Uh, Donna, I would say it is more like a grudge, something that you nurse, something that grows into bitterness. We all have flashes of anger. We all lose our temper from time to time and blow our top. Hopefully it's not something that happens very often. But we're human, and we get mad. Um, and there is a righteous anger. Jesus he says that he was he became angry at the hardness of their hearts. So yeah, we get mad, uh, we get frustrated. These are all part of of our emotional makeup and all part of our um, who we are as people. I think what Scripture is talking about. Even Paul was very specific in saying, "Don't let the sun go down on your anger," meaning don't. Don't dwell on it. Don't hang on to it. Because uh, if, if you are angry for too long of a period of time, it turns into bitterness. And bitterness will, um, will be very, very detrimental to your spiritual and your emotional and even your physical well-being. Uh, scientists and medical studies have proven that your intense emotional state has an effect on your physical body, and if it can affect your body, it can certainly affect your spirit. And actually, I think it probably is coming um, by the spirit anyway. The devil would love to keep us mad, keep us upset, and keep us all emotional, and that way we are not in the spiritual realm where we have a victory. So, uh, yeah, don't beat yourself up because you get mad every so often. You know, I get mad just about every day. <laughs> but that's not the only emotion that I experience, and that's not an emotion that I experience on a continual basis. If, if that is the case with you and your anger is something that you can't control, something that you can't manage, something that I don't want to be angry but I can't stop being angry, that's when you, you need to go to the next level and, and get some help with that. That's something that needs to be uh, managed, just the same as, as anything else needs to be managed. Anger management. It's very, uh, a, very, a very real problem for some people. But that's not the same thing as, a, as losing your temper or just those little flashes of anger you have. That's part of being a human being. Well, I'll take a couple more before we wrap it up. What event, this is from Larry. What event took place in your life for you to recognize at one point you were a self-sufficient Christian? I don't think it, it happened in the course of one instance or one event, but over a series of events where I realized that I can't do anything apart from Christ. And I think that's the first lesson that you learn in this discipleship with the Lord. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But see, it's human nature to try. And so we read that and we go, we move on and, and we, it doesn't really sink in. And so we go out and we try to do all kinds of things without the Lord. And it, it's, Larry, it's a, it's a series of disappointments and, um, and things that happen and the, things that happen with me and not so much one eye-opening experience because I'm pretty stubborn. I'm a very focused individual, and once I get focused on something, it's hard for me to uh, be distracted with anything else, and that, that's a good thing in a lot of ways, 
and in a lot of ways it's also a bad thing. If I get focused on the wrong thing, it's very difficult for me to turn around. So for a long, long period of my life, I was focused on ministry. I was focused on church. I was focused on religion. I was focused on pastoring. And so it took a series of disappointments uh, in, that con in, in those contexts for me to finally come to the conclusion that I was on the wrong path. And that's when I realized I was being self-sufficient instead of sufficient in the Lord. Um, but then, of course, there came a day where I finally said, that's it, no more, and uh, I got out of that. So uh, I hope that's, that's encouraging to you. Um, let's see. Tanya has a comment, and, and I think it's a good comment to end with um, to wrap up tonight's study. She says, not a question, just a comment. I am impressed with how active our role is as believers. Seek the things, set your mind, put to death, put off, put on. Very different from clergy laity of Christianity. Glad to be reminded our spiritual walk is our responsibility, not a pastor's and church's and not Chip's. Amen. I, I like that comment because that, that's, that's telling me if something happens to Chip, Tanya's spiritual life is not going to fall apart by any means because uh, you understand that you are responsible for your spiritual life. You're responsible for your spiritual growth and maturity. I am a facilitator of what, God is, is wanting to do, and God's using me to help and to encourage and to instruct and all these other things, but that's all it is. I'm just a facilitator. You're the, you're the one walking with God day by day, moment by moment, being conformed to his image, renewing your mind, searching the scriptures, being active in your role as a believer. I like that. Seek those things, set your mind, put to death, put off, put on, very active, as opposed to just sitting back, listening to me talk, uh, subscribing to emails and reading what everyone else has to say, and, and sitting passively in church, sitting passively at home watching the television, and uh, just listening to what everyone else is saying, subscribing to all these prophetic lists and reading what God is saying through all these other people, or, or I should say what people think God is saying through all these other people. Um, you know, five words that you hear from God on your own are worth more than 5,000 words that you can hear from me or from anyone else. So that that is very different from the way most people are taught, but uh, it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross daily, deny yourself, and follow after me. So that's that's the essence of discipleship, and that's the key to spiritual growth and maturity. Praise God. So praise the Lord. Um, we thank you, Lord, for tonight's study. Thank you for Colossians 3, for this great book. And, uh, you know, Lord, I, I know the tendency is for us to go to extremes. That's our human nature. And uh, when we're in church, when we are still in bondage to religion, we tend to be legalistic, and um, we tend to think it all depends upon us. We're focused on our works. We become hypocrites. We become proud. Uh, and, and then you begin to set us free from that, and a lot of times I've seen it, Lord, and I've even recognized it certainly in myself. We tend to go to the opposite extreme and then say, I don't have to do anything. I'm free in Christ. And Jesus has done it all, and so I don't have to do anything, and so we stop growing spiritually. So, Lord, I would just pray tonight, uh, most of all, that you would bring us to that, uh, that wisdom that's there in between the two extremes. That, yes, I, I thank God for the finished work of Christ on the cross for my salvation, but as far as my spiritual growth and maturity is concerned, I'm taking up the cross daily, setting my affection on things above, putting off the old, putting on the new man, and that's my responsibility. That's my stewardship. And uh, so we do that, Lord, by faith and not uh, with any trust or conviction in ourselves or in our own abilities, 
but knowing full well that apart from you, we can't do anything. But through you and because of you, through Christ who strengthens us, we can do all things. So I thank you for that, and I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. That um, concludes our study for this week. Next week we'll be in Colossians chapter 4, and we'll wrap up our study of Colossians. And then after that, uh, we'll begin in a new book, and I will hold that as my surprise for you until uh, next week. We appreciate your support. It's your gifts that makes it possible for us to be able to do this on uh, such a large scale, and so we appreciate your your giving to the School of Christ so that we can keep it free. And uh, thanks for taking the time out to come and participate. I apologize for the technical difficulty and not being able to get your, your uh, voices on here, but we'll try again next week. Until that time, this is Chip Rogdon at theschoolofchrist.org. Thanks for being a part of the Internet Bible Study. God bless you. Have a good night, and take care.